this WRRC seminar session. Um, the, so this is the second to last in the semester. Um, this week we have Bilik Darmiasi, uh, who will be talking about the Subak irrigation system in Bali. And this week I'll be turning it over to my co-host Aurora, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing um, this week's speaker. Wiwik Darmiasi is a lecturer at the Department of International Relations, Universitas Udayana, and a research associate at the Dala Institute in Bali, Indonesia. She is actively engaged with World Heritage Watch, a network focused on protection, management, and conservation of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, Ms. Darmiasi's research focuses on political geography, conflict transformation, and community-based natural resources management. She is a practitioner committed to supporting the management of Bali's cultural landscape, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. She has also worked on climate change adaptation initiatives involving local perspectives of change and has supported disaster risk uh, recovery. Um, sorry, disaster, disaster risk reduction efforts with a special focus on issues related to water equity, youth, and women. Um, she earned her bachelor's in international relations from the Universitas, and I'm going to probably <laughs> mispronounce most of this, but a university okay. in um, Indonesia and an MA in politics from a university in New Delhi, India. And, um, and so um, I'm gonna add, WeWeek is, is currently based in Hawaii. And so it was very exciting to, um, yeah, to think about this opportunity where we can learn from Bali's um, systems and think about them in the Hawaii context. So with that, um, thank you so much, uh, Wiwik, and um, take it away. Thank you, Aurora. Uh, I also want to thank everyone at the Water Resources Research Center for inviting me to talk today. Um, I must say I'm not, an, I'm not a hydrologist or an engineer. I don't have agricultural background. So my talk here only based on my experience working with the farmers during the nominations to be a World Heritage Site and after it became a World Heritage Site. So um, I'm from Bali and just recently moved to Hawaii. I don't know if you have heard of Bali before, but this is what you get when you Google Bali. Um, it is one out of more or less 17,000 islands in Indonesia, and it's famous for its surf, resort, and most importantly, its culture. Uh, Bali is known as the Island of the Gods. Uh, the island is pre uh, predominantly a Hindu community, so each household has a temple or shrine in their house. Hence, Bali is also known as uh, the Island of a Thousand Temples, although Looking at the current total population, it probably has more than a million temples. It is also known as the last paradise and you will be welcome. I don't know if you can see it, the sign, uh, when you arrive at the Ngurahara International Airport. Just to give you a comparison on size, Bali is almost four times bigger than Oahu uh, with a total population of 4.3 uh, million people in 2019. And to give you an overview of the island, here's the map of Bali. Uh, here lies the highest mountain on the island. It's called Mount Agung. Uh, and here are the lakes, the water, uh, which the water sources of the island located. And here is the area where you can see mostly where the Subak system or the rice terraces are still located. And uh, tourism is mostly centered in the southern part of the island. So when you arrive at the airport, you will be, you know, welcomed by this area where you, if you like, like serving or nightlife, this is the place. Uh, if this is where international convention or meeting usually happening, like the G20 next year. This is all areas famous for its serving. If you like cultural tourism, if you want to do yoga, carving, dancing, you usually go to this place. It's called Ubud. Uh, maybe you've heard it from Eat, Pray, Love, uh, the book and the movie. And this is where I'm from. It's called Tabana, this big area here. And this is the location of my research, uh, which is also the World Heritage Site and my focus for today's presentation. So Subak and UNESCO destination. So what is Subak? This is one photos of the Subak landscape in Jatilui. It is an institution of farmers that manage water, uh, irrigation water. 
in Bali, and it has existed for a thousand years, and it represents the Trihitakarana philosophy. This is the Trihitakarana philosophy, three causes of prosperity or happiness, uh, which includes the harmonious relationship between people and the realms of like spiritual realms or God, people with people, and then um, relationship between people and the environment. And this is what the Trihitakarana implementation looks like. You have the mountain as the water catchment area. You have the lake uh, as the water resources for the island. You have the villages here where farmers live. Um, they don't necessarily, necessarily came from the same village. And this is like the area of the rice terraces here, the Subak landscape. And this is the relationship with the spiritual realms. In every water division, uh, small canals are going to the rice fields. They always have a shrine. It could be made of concrete or a bamboo. And they perform ceremonies at temples. Uh, this is one of examples, uh, ceremonies conducted by farmers in a Subak temple. So farmers uh, collect the water from the water resources and build a dam. And it runs through these channels to go into rice terraces. Uh, those collecting water from the same source, the same water source, are called uh, one suba. And I got this from my team who sent me this video a couple of days ago. So the uniqueness of suba is because they have this one inlet and one outlet system. So the water needs to, uh, to run through each uh, or every rice field until it goes back to the river. So the number of water that goes into the uh, rice field and the number of water that goes out is the same. The subak is managed by the head of farmers. These are the 20 heads of subak that I work with uh, in one of the sites of the World Heritage Site. They are selected by the member and they're called pakase. So they need to coordinate between one another to make sure that the water runs through from one subak to the other subak. Now, the boom of tourism industry uh, in Bali slowly threatens the existence of the subak system. You can see here the rice terraces, and then you have a road going to all this development here. And uh, this land use change in the island has resulted in the loss of rice field of about 700 up to 1,000 hectares uh, per year. So um, another reason is the existence of Subak mostly depends on its water sources. And um, before the pandemic, Bali received an average of 8 million domestic visitors and 4 million foreign visitors like every year. So this also uh, increased the demand of water in tourism places. I'm going back again to this map so you can see that all these water resources here are now being diverted to meet all the water needs in this area. And you can see the rice terraces up here. And because most of the water channels into those tourism area here, uh, one household a family with four member in Bali uh, uses around 164 liter per day. And one visitor in a hotel in this area could use up to like a thousand until 4,000 liter per day. So this, just to give you an overview of the water demand in the southern part of the island. Now this resulted in decreased water to the subak system. You can tell that they're getting dry. Uh, the, level of the water in the dams, they're diminishing. And then there's the increasing use of the ground, ground, uh, groundwater well. And this gives the pressure to the aquifer of the island. So at the end of the 1990, early 2000, the government has the idea to propose the Subak system uh, to be inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, this is an effort to protect and conserve these traditional system that already lasted for a thousand years. It was inscribed by UNESCO in 2012, and there are four sites. Uh, here is the Supreme Water Temple, Puro Urun Danu Batur and Lake Batur, to show the symbol or the importance of water for farming, for the Subak system. You have the Subak landscape of Pakrisan watershed. This is to show the area, the archaeological area that shows the Subak has existed since the 11th century. 
You have the Subak landscape of Chatur Anga Batukaru, which is also my location of my research. Um, it is the largest complex. It has 20 Subak as its member. Uh, this is also unique because this area is divided into a different district. Uh, and then you have the royal water temple, this little tiny dot here, uh, that shows the importance of the royal family in the old days because farmers uh, need to perform ceremony to get water here in the lake. So farmers from the southern area could not go here uh, in the old days. So they come here to the palace and the palace sent representative to collect water, bring it back to the kingdom, and then the farmer can just collect the water from that area. Oops, sorry. So these four sites are located in five different autonomous districts in Bali. Now, to manage the site, the government established a governing assembly. Uh, it consists of various government institutions and local institutions like the village, uh, the temples, including the Subak itself. Now, this governing assembly was established because from the research that I conducted in 2010 with a professor from the UK, we found out that um, water is managed by 11 different government agencies. So the idea of the governing assembly was basically to help coordinate among these different agencies. Farmers are like confused. In the old days, they have the river, they get the water, collect the water uh, to their rice fields and then irrigate their rice fields, but now they have different government agencies. If they have water problem, the government would say, oh, is it running in the forest? You have to go to the Department of Forestry. Oh, is it a groundwater? You have to go to the Department of Mining. If it goes to the household, you have to go to Public Works. So these different governing uh, uh, agencies kind of like confusing for the farmers. But the establishment of the governing assembly was also ineffective because of the overlapping authority from each institution, they're autonomous. They're from different district. Um, there's also the need to um, growing interest in economic development because in one Subak uh, where my research uh, is located, there was an increase of 400% of visitor in the first couple of years since UNESCO listed the site as World Heritage Site. So there's this growing um, demand or interest that they need to kind of like do development or utilization instead of just protection of the culture and the ecosystem of the cultural landscape. Uh, we work with representative from the kingdom. We work with representative from the temple. We did participatory mapping with the farmers, with the Subak uh, head, uh, the Pakase. Uh, we do GIS technology mapping and then combine with their knowledge of their own area, just making sure uh, that the management can be integrated. They created a sustainable tourism strategy uh, with UNESCO representative. Um, the government trying to establish this coordination and communication forum between um, this over here with the green shirt, they're like government officials and with traditional shirt, they're the, the Subak head, trying to talk about how to best manage um, the landscape. This is also becoming uh, ineffective because the question of conservation and development, uh, they seem to never get along so well. In 2015, in Subak Jatilui, uh, which is also the main viewing site of the World Heritage Site, there was a development of a parking lot. One of the farmers uh, who had this land, who has this land, uh, say that there's a traffic congestion in the area, in this road, and he was concerned about, you know, transportations in the area. So he has this idea to build a parking lot. That was his argument. At the end of the day, it turned out to be this massive uh, restaurant. Um, and, you know, people start to like asking like, oh, if he can build restaurant that big, then maybe I can also build a small vendors to sell snacks or whatever to visitor coming to this area. But this it's also to show that this building disrupt the water from this area coming here. And then you can really see now start, to, there's changes in this um, rice field where the farmers need to plant different crop because the lack of water. In 2019, we had a photo voice uh, initiative. We invited eight people, old farmers, young people and women, just to get the idea uh, to see their perspective about their own site uh, after it become a World Heritage Site. So these are the participants. Uh, the photos in the slides are mostly taken from them. 
almost all taken by them. We give them a camera to these farmers. Uh, they never have a camera. They never hold a camera in their hand before. We have to train them how to use camera. Uh, this is also to empower them, to give them confidence, uh, to tell stories from their own perspective. At the end of the week, we ask them to take photo for a week. At the end of the week, uh, we kind of hold meetings with them and let each participant take a look at the photos they took and present why uh, they take those photos. So some of the emerging issues that came out uh, from this initiative, the first one is the land use change. This is also interesting because this photo give us the perspective from the farmers. Uh, we only see like, okay, there's a land use change, there's a rice field being, you know, developed into this building. But from the farmers, they say, this is a river. And this building is very close to, uh, to the river. It will increase pollution. That's what they say. And the other thing is, paddies are a sacred thing. It's a sacred place. By building this steps on top of the paddies, you're basically walking on top of the goddess of Sri, which is the goddess of prosperity, symbol by the paddies. So everything in this pictures for them is wrong. This is regu uh, government regulation saying not to build in green belt area, but you can see from the photos, it's building everywhere. There's this rice wheel in the back corner, which we probably won't see again in the next five or 10 years. So, uh, the farmers even uh, joke that this sign is just like a frog. It just keep moving. When there's a development, they move the board away. So just to show that there's lack of enforcement from the govern, uh, government authority about the regulations that they have to protect this rice terraces. Now, this is one of my favorite photo that was taken by the farmers to show that this is a development of tourism attraction, uh, like Instagrammable places, all this large swing so you can take a photo and put it in your Instagram. And this development disrupting the water flows to the rice field here. You can see here the farmers still farming, but planting different crops. And interestingly, still raising the flag of the country, even though he's pretty much pressured by all this development surrounding his area. One of the participants went up to the forest to show deforestation to show how changes at the upper stream um, with deforestation, people cutting trees, and then to show the landslide at the downstream because of these deforestation happening in their area. Labor and gender in the Subak becoming uh, another issue that was brought up by the farmers because um, we don't really see them, although we know that it's there, the problem of women's there. Dadong, one of the oldest participants in the Photo Voice Initiative, took these photos by accident. She just wanted to take a photo and to show this is where my rice field belong. But, uh, you know, because of this photo of the motorbike, she finally able to tell a story how her granddaughter, her daughter fell off the cliff here a couple of times because this road is very narrow, it's very small. The irrigation, uh, the irrigation can, uh, channels are broken, it needs to be managed fix and she also requests if it's possible to just put a cover here without disrupting the flow of the water so it's uh, the road is wide enough to bring like a pickup truck so it's easier for her to carry harvest instead of walking back and forth um effort to do for organic fertilizer apparently also created uh another issues for for the woman because the cows they put it here it's easier for the dung to flow in the water, to be like organic fertilizer. But this woman said, now we have more work because we have to feed the cows. In the old days, they let the cows roam around the grass field. Uh, they find food by themselves. Now they just have to attend to the, to the cows in the barn and have um, to do extra work to feed them. The ceremonies also like a big role in the Subak system. They have to perform ceremony uh, before and after, uh, before planting or after harvesting or before harvesting, sorry. So this is one of the temple of the Subak system. This is all made by the women, performed by the women. Uh, this is, I think, a ceremony before they did harvest. Uh, so to do farming, 
people need to do uh, people need to perform some rituals they need to collect water from the supreme water temple uh, at the lake sprinkle the water to the rice field before allowing the water to irrigate the rice fields and many other steps um, of rituals i think if i'm not mistaken there are like 17 different rituals that they need to perform uh, before planting and then uh, until harvesting This is a traditional rice uh, planted in uh, Subak Yatului, the area that I uh, do research. Uh, they have to use a traditional cutter called Ani Ani to, uh, to cut the paddies because this is a symbol of Devi Sri, the goddess of Sri. They have to cut it one by one. They cannot use machine uh, also to show respect uh, other than that it's being very, like they have a very hard husk. I don't know whether it's called husk in English. Um, this is for the other type of rice. So in one year, they do two planting, the traditional rice and the hybrid rice. And this is the hybrid rice where they can use machine there. But this is also showing the division of labor, how women are usually doing the cutting and then carrying the harvest on their head, going back and forth to the rice field, to the main road. So that kind of also explained the photo from the previous photo that, you know, uh, the old woman asked if it's possible to build a wide enough uh, road for the pickup truck to enter these areas. Uh, women not only work in their rice field, they also work in different rice fields. According in the Subak system, they have these um, consensus who's planting first. They have to plan together, but who's planting first up until who's the last one, and then they kind of work together cooperatively. Uh, helping one rice field or one farmers to the other farmers. This is the work where they try to fix the irrigation channels. And here it shows the photo of the men just doing the commanding kind of work and the women have to carry all the materials or mixing all the cements and everything. And this is how they do the um, work together. They work together to clean the irrigation canals before every season started. And this is also interesting because this photo was taken by one of the farmers to show that after it became a World Heritage Site, uh, the, um, the money that they receive from ticketing uh, is now being kind of divided to the farmers, very little. Uh, so that every activity like this one, now they uh, receive about a dollar and a half more or less. And according to the farmer that it's okay, but it also changes the social dynamic because now people come and do this work because they have incentive instead of their responsibility as part of the SUBA. Tourism is another issue that they want to raise. Uh, there's an increasing number of visitors going to their rice field. This is a SUBA road uh, now used by visitors as their tracking uh, site. Uh, this is the participant of the photo voices uh, trying to show in this pictures that tourists are more attractive talking to him when he bring his cows to the river to bath the cows instead of talking to farmers working with a machine. This is the main road in the Subak, which is also the viewing uh, area. There's a UNESCO sign here. Most tourists would just stop here, take photos, uh, you know, and have lunch in the restaurant around this area. And this is really disrupt the road uh, of the farmers going and back, going back and forth from their rice field to their home. So during like rush hour lunchtime, for example, where they want to go home and eat some food before they go back to the rice field, uh, they're stuck in this traffic because tourists want to take photos. There's a number of people also going to the rice field, doing shooting, filming, uh, without asking permission from the farmers, just, you know, stepping on the rice terraces, which for the farmers are very sacred. Uh, another example of tourism activity uh, in, the, in the Subak Road. And also, this is interesting photo that taken by one of the participants that, you know, taking the photo of the tourists and then the tourists feel awkward, asking, what are you doing? And the farmers finally have this ability to say, like, this is what you've been doing to us, too. Taking photo of us without asking, uh, what are you doing? Or whether we want it to be photographed. 
there's a number of tourism attractions uh, conducted by the government, uh, making like festival within the rice terraces, uh, scarecrow with different costumes and themes. Um, this really disrupt uh, the water flow because they throw the waste to the irrigation channels. Uh, all the farmers start complaining how the water is no longer clear and fresh, but you know they turn green and black color. And also they disrupt uh, the whole system of the suba. Farmers work from sun uh, from morning to sunset, and then they're not allowed to enter the rice field. But then the government start making tourism activities attraction by making like three days music festival in this area, which just disrupt the whole um, the whole livelihood of the of the farmers there. Uh, the farmer also seeing the importance of the water resources. This is the river during the dry season. And this is a local people who live in the area. And he also, he can't speak English. So sometimes he works as a guide. He brings the tourists not to just look at the rice terraces as a photograph or Instagrammable site, but also to show them this is what Zubak life, asking them to walk around these areas. Um, in 2015, there are like 192 more or less water sources in this area, but because of the use of ground water well and the diversion of water, a lot of rivers becoming very dry. Uh, I think less than a hundred is active there. I don't know how many more today. Uh, so they want to have more responsibility or more involvement in the visitor management to the site. Pest, pesticide and organic farming also became one of the big themes uh, in the Photo Voice Initiative because the green revolution that was introduced in the 1970s with the use of chemical fertilizer and also how to get rid of pests really increases the number of pests going to the rice field. The bird that eats the patties, uh, the mice that goes and disrupt or just ruin the patties. And one of the farmers used dragonfly as an indicator uh, on the use of pesticide. He said when he was young, there's a number, there's a lot of butterf uh, dragonfly now you can just see one or two, which shows the increasing dependency uh, using this chemical fertilizer um, in farming. And this is to show the effort to do organic farming. One of the farmer took a photo of the bean that he planted. Everyone was asking what kind of fertilizer you're using. And he said, no, this is completely organic. And, and they just didn't believe him because uh, there are only four farmers, three or four farmers now trying to be organic in the era. It's just so difficult for them to move away from organic farming uh, because um, the water is very much polluted with uh, chemicals right now. So unless there's, a, how to say, agreements uh, from the upper, upper stream to the downstream that they not using chemical fertilizer again, then only returning to organic farming will be successful. Uh, but from our photo voice initiative, this helps the farmer to talk about uh, the issues or the challenges that they're facing uh, from their own perspective on the management of the landscape. This is a visit from a student, international student from University of Maryland that's in the area. And we give opportunities to the farmers to just present to them um uh, their own concern we also conducted ex exhibitions and meeting with different government agencies including uh, the unesco representative uh, in indonesia uh, where the farmer present their photos their concern and their needs to be heard uh, unfortunately we cannot do an in-person exhibition because of COVID. Uh, so to conclude my presentation uh, tourism is transforming land use and Balinese are moving away from farming. Parents, uh, they're telling their children not to be farmers. Uh, quoting uh, the professor I work with at the Subak Research Center, they're saying like, being a beggar in the city um, in Bali is way, way more profitable than being a farmer in, in Bali. Uh, they also need to pay like a higher tax to their rice field because when there's a villa or restaurant or any tourism infrastructure built next to a rice field, 
the prices for the taxes that they need to pay every year mm -hmm. increases up to a thousand percent. So there's no use. And if there's a conversion in one of the rice terraces, it disrupts the water flow. So it, for farmers, it's just better for them to also sell their, their land. A uh, strategic national area with this uh, the establishment of the governing assembly, the coordination communication forum. Um, it's just like, it's just creating another uh, challenges because of these overlapping institutional authority between different districts since uh, decentralization. And this establishment of this kind of authority also undermining the local Subak institutions, authority are being, take, um, being taken away from the farmers or the Pakase and decided by all these different government agencies. Um, conservation development tension still unfolding. Uh, there are young people now thinking that becoming a World Heritage Site, you have the Subak system, it's an opportunity to attract more tourists. And there's young people who also want to use, kind of like protect their farming system and to return to the traditional way of farming, to not use machine, going back to the old traditional tools. So it will be for them to decide because you know it's still unfolding. Uh, and the last one, uh, the local perspective are important and wants uh, through, this, through the Photo Voice initiative that we did, uh, we kind of like hear or empower vulnerable communities to voice their concern and to get involved uh, in the decision-making process of the management of the landscape. Because uh, from UNESCO perspective, uh, the reason why it became a World Heritage Site, they have to return their authority back to the farmer as the native guardian of the landscape, people who own the land, people who live, and people who manage the land, the Subak landscape in Bali. And that's how I end my presentation. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, would uh, I'd like to open up the floor for questions now. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to turn on your mic and ask. Uh, this is Sean Moss from Oceanic Institute at Hawaii Pacific University. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I was wondering if you knew how much uh, Bali's rice uh, supply comes from local producers versus imported from other parts of Indonesia or from outside the country. Okay, I don't really know the exact number on, of that, but uh, it was an interesting question that I asked to the farmers when I when I first did the research and looking at the water equity and tourism in Bali in 2010. Uh, and I say, I asked the farmers, one of the farmers saying like, if you sell your rice, uh, rice field, uh, where would you get the rice uh, to eat and to perform your ceremonies? Uh, he said, I just keep a small patch where I can, you know, keep planting rice for the ceremony but for food and everything, we're just gonna get it from Java. So that's the whole idea of, of, uh, of the farmers on, on the rice meat. So, but I'm sorry, I didn't know the, the number uh, to answer your questions. Oh no, that's fine, thank you. One other real quick question. How difficult is it to establish a World Heritage Site? Is that a Herculean effort that takes a lot of effort or is, uh, what is that process like? Uh, I think the government, um, since the beginning, it was proposed. It took like 12 years until it was inscribed. Uh, the nominations got, you know, cut off. They, I mean, it's very European way of, you know, getting your site in, inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, they say you cannot put uh, rice terraces that already has like land changes there. There's already housing nearby. You just have to cut the site. Uh, the values to show that you're an outstanding uh, site that needs to be protected. Uh, yeah, it was it was very difficult, and um, which is also interesting because twelve years uh, period of nominating the site. I only joined the last couple of years. At the end, uh, people come and go, so. 
I'm interested myself to uh, to hear or to know uh, is the beginning or the reasons they nominate the side uh, to protect the subak or just to get um, kind of like new um, prestige in the area that you have a world heritage site in Bali. Terima kasih banyak. Sama sama. Okay, I see a hand up in the uh, Zoom participants. I'm going to call in Chris now. Sorry, Aurora. <laughs> I mean, uh, for your presentation, that was so rich and full of information and really exciting can to see. Hear me? So can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's uh, a little bit far. Talk louder. <laughs> Um, thanks for your presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could um, talk a bit more about like the exact parameters that you gave to the research participants for the photo voice project. Um, and then what the conversations that you had with them following that, like how that actual process like unfolded. Um during the nomination dossier, my involvement, I always talk to a representative from local government and the farmers, right? It's always the head of the SUBAC, never really talk to the other part, the other member of the uh, SUBAC, like the women or the young people there. So when Photo Voices uh, International, an NGO based in Bali, uh, approached me and said, like, let's do something in Jatilui. It, we just came out with the idea, a very simple idea, like, what do you think about Subak? What do you know about Subak? Because I'm not from agriculture, I don't have agricultural background, and I only know about the Subak system based on the academics that I work with, um, international experts saying, like, this is what Subak should be and everything, you know? So, um, and it's true, because uh, when we selected this participant, we asked them to draw in a paper saying like what Subak is for you. They draw all the mountains, they draw all the rice terraces, the temples, the village. They forget to draw themselves within in their drawing. So he's saying like, why don't you draw yourself there? Because you're part of the Subak. So, and then we gave them camera because if you go to a meeting in Bali, uh, the woman will not say anything. Not so many people are able to talk. So we give them camera and we just say like, look, here's a camera for you. Uh, we're gonna train you how to use it and take photo, take whatever photo you want um, and tell me what Subak is. Um, and that just, you know, uh, during the process that was very interesting, all the young people taking photos, focusing on the like, you know, focus, they're very good in that, right? Like Instagrammable kind of photos, taking flowers, taking different angles of the, the Subak, the rice terraces, uh, while the farmers, their photos are blurry, they're like, you know, they're not focused. But when they tell stories, when we say, okay, why you take photo of this flower? The young would say, the lighting is good. It's so good in this angle. And when we talk with the farmers, the, the older one, they said, oh, that's because we don't know this flower. In the old days, we don't have this type of flowers here. This is the plant, the kind of plant that we use uh, that we, you know, they put here as a barriers from one rice field to the other. And if there's a Water division, somebody's pouring our water. We put this plan just to, just to show a symbol. They're more rich in, in telling stories. So we kind of like, we also use that opportunity to exchange this, uh, to have discussion between the young farmer and the old farmers or the young people who's not working as farmers to the farmers to have these, you know, discussion because World Heritage Sites, these young people need to inherit all this rice field in the future. And um, after a couple of weeks, uh, the woman, one of the women, the oldest participant came to us and said like, wow, thank you so much. You give me new meaning in my life because now I'm finally able to tell story. Taking the photo of that uh, motor and the rice field and the irrigation. At first, you just say, oh, I take this photo because it was beautiful. I'm sorry, there's motorbike there. But, and then we say, okay, tell me about what do you see from the motorbike? What's wrong with the motorbike being in the photo? And then it just build up the story in there, you know, just remind her, oh yeah, my daughter fell off because of that. They don't fix the channel for years. I've been asking for the head of the SUBAC to help talk to the government agency to get funding to build this, you know, water channels, everything. So. It was a very like, you know, we had a very rich discussion 
not just between us, the researcher and the participant, but also among the participant because uh, the woman has the issues. They don't know how to talk to authorities and the man who said like, oh, you should do this because you know we learned that in every meeting they attended. I hope that answers the question though. Absolutely, yeah, a quick follow-up question. Yes. Um, going into this, did you expect for those gendered and generational um, like stratifications to emerge or did you not expect that? Um, I didn't really expect that to happen. I didn't really, um, I didn't expect this. Uh, there's, a, there's a generational gap. Even between the old farmers, they're also like, uh, have different opinions. Like the oldest participant is 70 years old. And then we have farmers that are like 40 and 50 years old. They already have a different idea of what Subak is. And then you have a participant, uh, I think the youngest one is like 14 years old. They, they don't know. They always, the way he presented his photo is like, oh, I wanna help the farmers, you know, use more machine. I wanna help farmers to be more green, uh, you know, not using plastic as scarecrow, but using more traditional thing. And then, you know, the other participant was like, what do you mean helping the farmers? I mean, you're part of us, <laughs> you're our kids. You don't wanna be farmers or what? So it kind of like, um, yeah, a lot of interesting thing came out there, uh, especially because like I mentioned earlier in meetings, they usually just invited male into the meeting. So women are not usually able to talk. And um, through these photo voices, not everybody has the ability to um, to say what they want to say, right? But when they see the photo that they're taking, it gives them power to tell like, okay, I took that photo, it belongs to me, it, the story belongs to me. Yeah. There are like other themes also that uh, came out from the Photo Voice Initiative, but I didn't present it today. Just focusing so, on the water issue. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. So um, in terms of the UNESCO heritage um, actually being a way to protect um, the Subak and those um, traditional you know, patties, I'm wondering how their role actually has been in that protection because there's so many issues going on, right? Like, what kind of role could they actually take that could protect those patties in any way? I'm curious. Yeah, UNESCO really didn't have the authority to uh, punish the state if they mismanage the site. Uh, they just basically able to say, hey, look, you don't do this correctly. You have to do it based on what you promised us during the nomination dossier. If not, then we might you know, put you in an endangered list, which is humiliating for a state. But uh, when we talk to the farmers, they say like, are you proud being a World Heritage Site? They said, yeah, we're so proud. And we don't want it to be ever taken away from us because it helps the world to watch what's happening with us. With the increase of social media use now, uh, in 2000, yeah, 2015, after the development of the parking lot, there's a lot, of, there's a massive development in the area, including a helicopter, helipad, where people from, you know, tourists with money, the VVIP could just, you know, fly in there and then have lunch and then fly out. And they changed this patch of rice terraces to be a helipad. It went to the media because people start saying like, hey, isn't this a world heritage? Aren't you supposed to do this? Hashtag UNESCO and everything. It really get the attention of like media. And immediately after that, the government said, oh, no, it's not a helipad, although we have a photo of the helipad there and helicopter and everything. I said, no, they deny it, of course. But then they say, it's just a place, you know, for a melting pot. People can meet there and talk, which is like, you know. So that's, that's one of the way how being inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage Site helped them. And the other one is uh, because it's a World Heritage Site, the national government in Jakarta has this uh, responsibility to turn it into a strategic national area, which mean they have these integrated system to manage the mm -hmm. area, like different ministry will come, uh, different government, local government agency to come, just making sure that the site is protected and, you know, conserve. So that's another thing, but, you know, 
it has challenges like I presented. It just also taking away the authority from the, the farmers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is it my turn? Okay. Yeah, um, so. Thanks, Lilik, for that. I, I have more um, I have some questions that you know are both technical and then sort of um, socio-political. Um, I guess the first one was in those in the subak, are they constantly flowing or or are they timed or rotated on a schedule? Like a, do they flow I mean, day and night? The crops or the of the, the water. Oh the water. water. Oh yeah. Oh they well, it depends on their planning, right? When they first need to do um, planting, they have to run the water there uh -huh. to get rid of the pests. I hope I'm saying this correctly because, again, I'm not from agricultural background. Oh, yeah. This is just from my experience working with the farmers. So they flooded the rice field just to kind of like get rid of the pests like mice, for example, and then let it flow again. And, and the waters just keep running they, 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 I don't think they stay. Yeah. And if, uh, for example, the water sources are like, the level is lower, then each subak coordinate with each other, which, uh, which area need to be, which get the flow of the water first. Mm -hmm. And if other subak wanted uh, more water, they usually talk to the, say the upper stream saying like, hey, we need more water. Is it okay with you? the head of the subak would talk to the members and like they want to borrow some water is it okay and then they say yeah we get enough water that we need and so they diverted the flow of the water to the subak that needs it they call it they're borrowing water but they never actually return anything they just say that's the term we need yeah. to borrow water yeah i guess it's interesting because in hawaii now like lo'i like the irrigated fields are constantly flooded but if you look or there's at least one document I've seen that like in Manoa and Monaco, you know, who wrote on kind of Hawaiian water practices that there would be a scheduling, this field would get irrigated on these hours of the day and, yeah. and there was coordination. So the other thing is, so how do farmers like manage disputes, I guess, within their subak and, and is it? Yeah, they have, uh, they have regular meeting. They have regular between, meeting between their members. They have regular meeting with the, each pakase, uh, head, head of subak. They have regular meeting with head, uh, the priests from the temples. That's how they do their kind of like in interaction. Like they cannot just play, they cannot just say, okay, it's time to plan, let's plan. They go to the priest saying like, okay, what is the best day to plan? The priest will find a good day. This is the best way to plan. This is the kind of uh, ceremony they have to perform. And then the subak will go back to their members saying like, okay, uh, the type of rice that we need to plan, how many water that we need, if there's not enough water, what kind of crops that we need to plan. So all those discussion. And in every subak, they have, uh, they call it balet timbang. It's just a small patch of land. Uh, they call it the, I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, it's an area where people usually go there and talk about if they have issues, a brief talk when they have issues. Way in the old days, they used uh, coconut leaf, leaves, uh, sorry, coconut. And they poke a hole, put a water in it and let the water drips. So during the meeting, um, they have to talk their concern, their issues, their challenges and find solution as long as the water drips. When it's done, uh, with or without solution, the meeting ends. So they don't really waste time. So they don't do sweet talks, whatever. They come to a meeting, they immediately talk. This is the issues. This is how we need to solve it. If they can't solve it within the farmer's levels or subak, they go to the priest. Uh, they go to the kingdom, ask for their opinion. Because the belief of the farmers is priests. They're the kingdom of the mountain with the spiritual realm. Uh, kingdom is the representative of the people. So both world needs to meet if there's issue. Um, if there's pests, this is an interesting story. If there's a mice, uh, they don't call it as mice or mouse or rats. They are not allowed to say that. They call uh, Jirokatut or the little king. They would say, oh, I have a lot of little kings in my field now, what to do? So they go to the priest 
and they go to the king to, to say, okay, this little king needs to be uh, sent away. So they perform a ceremony, they perform a cremation, like how they perform cremation to human, to this little king, asking permission from the king of the mountain and king of the people to perform the ceremony. The king of the people usually have a special dagger to, uh, for rice field ritual, farming ritual. Uh, the farmer was just gonna follow the king, raising the dagger around the area infected with the mice. According to the farmers in the area where I work with, it always worked. So yeah, that's just one of the idea when uh, how they kind of solve it problems. But have those, are those methods useful, I guess, say if you have a dispute with the, your neighbor who's building something or, you know, how, does, does that social system still work? I don't even yeah, know. I mean, uh, in the old days, they would just talk, right? They say like, look, uh, this is what happened in my family. Um, say they have this only rice field and then they have two sons, they both get married. We need to have a place, more place for them to live. They talk to the Subak members and then they just say like, okay, find solutions on, you know, best way to do it. Uh, but now because of tourism, farmers with capitals and access to change their like, you know, uh, land into villa, for example, or restaurants, it created also issues to the other farmers because like I mentioned, the taxes for the land goes up, up to like 1,000%. Yeah. The water disrupted. The shadow of the building doesn't give a direct access of sunlight to their paddies. They usually just like start to like crumble. So in the southern part of the island, uh, from the map that I show you, it was a Subak area. I mean, in my university, for example, next to the wall of my building, we still see this temple of the Subak temple. They don't know, they don't know, you know, they cannot demolish that. But there's no more rice field. It's all building. Slowly and slowly, it's just going to be like, you know, uh, change. So. UNESCO World Heritage is one of the way, according to the government, to help protect, to stop this land, uh, land use change. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, it's, it's not unlike in Hawaii where someone builds a rental and your, the neighbor's property taxes go up and it eventually changes landscape. Anyways, mm -hmm. I, I'll let Sayaka, I have so many more questions, but <laughs> let Sayaka go. Hi. Hi. Hey, um, thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, I, I was wondering how the um, recent Kelowna crisis have in any ways reshaped the kinds of discussions happening um, about the tourism development, um, because I think uh, many places uh, who suffered with the tourism over tourism development, now realize how dependent their livelihood was. And now many people might have to uh, switch their um, investment. Yeah. Um, I wonder if uh, how that changed in any ways that conversation that happens with farmers. Um, that's an interesting question, Sayaka, but my research team is going to the field like from today or maybe yesterday, December 1st, to do the survey with the farmers because the government finally allowed people to move around now, uh, lifting the, you know, not be able to travel during COVID. But you're right, uh, when COVID happened, Bali is the one that hit very hard because of this pandemic. There's no international tourists. I think they just opened the international airport uh, in October, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, people are like, they say returning back to farming, although they also say like they don't know how to farm anymore. Um, farmers argue that they survive, but they also kind of feel challenged because a lot of people, a lot of household now uh, build this uh, hydroponic, if I'm saying correctly, hydroponic uh, vegetables, which kind of like disrupt uh, the prices in the market. Uh, oh, now everybody grow vegetables in their house. They don't buy it from me anymore. So yeah, but there is like a lot of saying, a lot of new saying like uh, young people from tourism industry, they can no longer live uh, in cities. They go back to the village and start farming again. And that's what we're trying to figure out by doing a survey. 
now, right now. I can tell you the answer in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I look forward to it. Because I think uh, um, at the individual levels too, I, I didn't really like the my wording of investment, but I, I some people I, I knew from the site I visited had uh, kind of long-term expect expectation that they're um, spending money to get a new car or re remodeling yeah. houses to host guests would get eventually pay off after mm. tourists arrive so I was wondering kind of like a financial burden that might be happening too so I, I really look forward yeah. to um, learning more about it in the future but yeah yeah we'll let Thank you know you. but I, <laughs> But um, when it first hit with all the, you know, restriction not to travel and move, um, mm. I still in constant communication with people from Jatilui, right? And they text mm. me like, oh, they are still building. They don't stop. There's no visitor, but they don't stop building because they have this idea. This will end and we just have to, you know, build as fast as possible to catch all the losses during the pandemic, which mm -hmm. is, which happened during the Bali bombing, for example, the tourism stop again for I think a couple of years and after that the island has no more blueprints on tourism development They just throw everything grow everything you know to attract more tourists because you know they need to catch up with all the losses that happen so hmm. I don't know but hopefully it doesn't happen this time yeah yeah okay thank you so much so good to see you thank you Sayaka okay uh, it looks like we're about out of time um so we'll wrap up there um, if anyone has any follow up questions, maybe we can leave Wee Week's email in the chat and um, people can contact her uh, with follow ups or you can contact me and I can put you in touch. Um, yeah, so the next seminar is on December 15th, and that will be our last one of the series for the semester. Um, there's been a slight change to the schedule for the next presentation. Uh, so Dr. Tao Yan has invited his colleague. Jin Yong Liu to talk about per and polyfluoroalkyl substance pollution. Um, so you can look forward to that and I hope to see you there. Uh, Tom, looks like our director, Tom John Baluka, was not I, able to make it. Sorry. Yeah. No, Aurora. but I'll just add that. Um, or, yeah, um, he expressed his, his regrets that he had a household emergency that he was dealing with. But I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, to we uh, for your really great talk and kind of ability to transport us from Hawaii with some similar issues to Bali and maybe we can enhance that. I recently learned that we have Honolulu or Oahu or Hawaii has some sister states and, and I'm not sure if Bali's in there, but um, mm -hmm. look forward to seeing where your research goes and having more dialogues about irrigation and development. So. Um, Thanks everyone for attending. And I'm Carrie, did I miss anything that's part of the usual announcements other than come back in two weeks? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're good. Thank yep. you all everyone so much. for being here. Thanks for your interest. Thank you, everyone.